Respected Chair, dear colleagues, I thank you for the kind invitation to speak to you today, although I'm quite sad that still this Congress, due to the COVID pandemic, cannot take place in person. Nevertheless, today's topic will be to speak about piezotome applications in the everyday dental practice. This lecture is based on publications we issued back in 2016 and 2017. It was a systematic analysis and systematic review on the knowledge of the application of piezotome surgical devices in the daily surgical routine of the dental practitioner. So before we start with science and evidence, which of course is one of the most important topics to understand why we have to use modern technology and contemporary technology in the treatment of our patients. Contrary to previous lectures, I want to open this lecture now with some clinical examples so that you can understand from the very beginning what piezotomes are and what you can do with piezotomes. So let's take a look at a comparison between rotary instruments and piezotomes. In the beginning, of course, you see some comical movie. But if you take a serious look at it, you will understand that until now we really worked somehow like this, with mechanical instruments and with brute force. Now, in this video, you can see a comparison how you deal with tooth extraction when you use piezotomes on the left side, especially when it comes to fractured teeth, ankylous teeth, and teeth that you cannot get grip on with the forceps. On the left side, you can see that with the piezotome, of course, you just cut the periodontal ligament without destroying the bone. So in case of the left side, you will be able to preserve the bone socket, the bony alveolar socket, to insert simultaneously an implant because the bone walls are not destroyed. Contrary on the right side, you see that of course it takes a lot of destruction of bone to get grip on the root, on the fractured root, so that finally you are able to extract the root. And since you were, since you had to destroy a lot of bone to remove this ankylous tooth, you of course will not be able to insert an implant immediately in most cases. So what does this mean in practical life? What when we speak about technological improvement? Perfect is the enemy of the good. It was a citation of Voltaire in the Dictionnaire Philosophique already back in 1770. When you remember, or most of you won't remember, that back in the 1980s, 1990s of the last century, um, one of the first mobile devices was a chunky telephone, mobile telephone like this. And of course, today, if someone gives you the choice between this old device and a brand new device like the um, recently published Samsung Galaxy S22 Ultra with super duper cameras, of course, you know what you're going to choose. But actually, it's all the same also in our basic profession as dentists, as periodontologists, as oral surgeons and, and implantologists. Development of technology moves on. And of course, we have to adapt to this new technology for our own benefit, to reduce the risk of our work, to reduce the risk for our patients, and to achieve better results with less invasive procedures. That's the golden standard in medicine, that once a new technology has proven benefits for both the surgeon and the patient, of course, we have to adapt 
and adopt this technology also in our daily routine. To give you another example, what you can see here is a very, very common situation. A fractured tooth, endodontically treated before. Of course, the crestal part of the fractured root can be removed very easily. For this, of course, you don't need a piezotone. But now it's up to you to decide how you want to proceed with the removal of the ankylosed root inside the socket. Of course, you cannot use forceps and get a grip on the fractured root because there is no space to get grip on the root. And of course, you can now proceed in the conventional way, in the traditional way, let's say in the old-fashioned way, that you just raise a flap, you mill the bone, with rotary instruments, you remove the, um, the bone, the alveolar bone, especially the buccal alveolar bone, with rotary instruments, and then you can remove the fractured root. Contrary with piezotomes, you can see here the tip for extracting teeth. It's called the so-called periodontal ligament cutter, because what you do with this one is simply you cut the periodontal ligament between the alveolar bone and the root. And as you can see here, instead of using levers, which might cause fractures of the ceramic here or additional fractures of the adjacent teeth, you just remove it with a pinzetta. This is the preservation of the rich this is the preservation of the soft tissues. If you take a close look here, you will see there is no lesion of the gingival aesthetics. There is no lesion to the bone. The buccal alveola was completely saved. So in case the patient decides to receive an implant here, in any case, you will be able to insert an implant in cases like this simultaneously. This gives less work for you, more satisfaction for the patient, and of course, less risk for inserting the implant. And a very, very much shorter treatment, overall treatment time for the patient. In case you decide not to go for implants, but to exchange the pres present crowns with the bridge, of course, especially for ladies, it's also of utmost importance that you preserve the gingival aesthetics, which is guaranteed if you use piezotomes, ultrasonic surgical instruments for tooth removal, because you preserve the buccal alveolar bone and you preserve the gingival aesthetics since you don't even touch it you don't disconnect the gingiva from the underlying bone. You preserve the anatomical structures. Of course, you can place some PRF graft in here to preserve the volume for on longhand. But you keep the vital tissues vital without disrupting the blood circulation, without disrupting physiological entities of the periosteum that gives the bone the proper nutrition. In the next case, you can see here, these are the tips that we use for removal of ankylosed roots and fractured teeth. This is another example. It's up to you to decide if you want to insert the implant immediately or not. But I give you this example because it shows you very, very clearly why piezotone surgical instruments are the new gold standard, starting with simple procedures like tooth extractions. Of course, there is no need to raise a flap if we want to remove this ankylosed root, but just for the demonstration of the critical anatomical structures 
the buccal compact plate of the alveolar crest, we raised a slide flap to demonstrate how the optimum preservation of the alveolar ridge can be achieved. You see here, after some few minutes of preparation, you can remove once again, as in the case before, the ankylosed root just with a pinzetta and just keep an eye on this structure here. This is fully preserved. This all is vital bone. In this case, of course, a small mucoperiosteal flap was raised, so the nutrition in this case is interrupted for the short time period, but this was just for the demonstration so that you have the clinical proof that the buccal alveolar bone was not destroyed, which you would have done with rotary instruments. And if you even if you use periodontal ligament cutters and instruments, of course, there would be multiple fractures of the bone and also some forces, unnecessary forces exerted to the adjacent teeth, which is, of course, in case of prostodontically treated teeth with ceramic crowns, pretty critical because when you use levers and periotomes, and you just hook up on the adjacent crown, you can fracture the ceramic of the crown, which then will lead to a discussion with the patient what you are going to do with the renewal of the crown. If it's the patient's fault, if it's the dentist's fault, who is going to pay for this? This is in the daily routine, unfortunately, also a lot of times a very, very crucial question. But before we start the treatment with piezotomes, of course, nowadays it's also of utmost importance to have a perfect diagnosis. And perfect diagnosis nowadays, as a new gold standard, is three-dimensional, because before we were only able to have a two-dimensional depiction of a three-dimensional anatomical structure in our patients. For this, it's just not the main topic of this lecture, but I just want to give you a short hint why 3D prevails over 2D diagnosis. There are some simple scientific facts which are already proven by references and by a broad range of literature, because we know that 3D prevails because the panoramic X-ray diagnosis only shows a two-dimensional overlay picture of a complex three-dimensional anatomy. And especially in the maxilla, so many anatomical structures overlay each other so that sometimes diagnosis is quite difficult in panoramic X-rays and also by misprojection and by different angulations also with intraoral x-rays. We furthermore know that CBCD diagnosis reveals pathologies unseen in panoramic, panoramic x-rays and allows precise individual determination of delicate structures, which also is highly important when we speak about removal of impacted third molars, removal of impacted canines, when we start to plan our sinus lift surgery, because we need to know where are the soft tissues that should not be harmed by our surgical procedures, especially when it comes to nerve and blood vessels, and of course, membranes like the sinus membrane. Last but not least, we know that CBCT allows bone quality determination and precise surgical planning and digital workflow from planning to aesthetic prosthetic treatment. The new software tools that are given in our hands in 3D diagnosis not only gives us a better tool for diagnosis to turn our patient's anatomy in all different viewing angles to find out what the pathologies are, it also gives us a proper tool to do a serious virtual planning of our entire treatment 
starting with the diagnosis, starting with the treatment options, the simulation of the treatment options, for instance, only prosthetic treatment, maybe prosthetic treatment in combination with implant therapy. If we need bone augmentation to place our implants in the precise anatomical position. And last but not least, the prosthetic setup, so that we have the whole picture of the patient's treatment already before we start the real treatment on our patient. This reduces the risk of failure. This reduces a lot of discussions with the dental technician. Once the implants are inserted and also integrated, of course, there is very, very little chance to change the position of the implants. Well, actually, there is no chance to change the position of also integrated implants. So if we already know before how the setup of the therapy will be, we can already avoid failures in the row in the course of the entire treatment. Not to stay too theoretically on this issue, what are the enhancements of daily routine diagnostics? Just to give you an example for the everyday clinical practitioner, for the dentist, for the periodontologist, and the oral surgeon, and also the endodontists. When we speak about diagnosis of possible granulomas, we all know these common situations. Patients received an endodontic treatment, or if it's a new patient, the patient tells you maybe, mm, sometimes I have some pain in the upper front. Then, of course, you will do an intraoral x-ray. What you can see in the intraoral x-ray, it's a perfect endodontic treatment and there is not the slightest hint that there could be something wrong around the apex of the root. Because what you can see in the intraoral x-ray tells you the periodontal ligament looks quite okay. And this reduced bone density here can be anything. But once you switch over to 3D, you perfectly see, yes, there is a granuloma on the apex of the root. Again, regarding endodontics, if you take an intraoral x-ray, in this case, you clearly see there is a big granuloma around the apex and around the root of this tooth. But for a precise planning of your patient's treatment, you need to know what are my options. If you just plan your treatment on a 2D intraoral x-ray, then of course the very first option might always be to do an episectomy. Why? Because an episectomy preserves the patient's own tooth. And this is what patients mostly want. And of course, it reduces the costs for the patient. If medical treatment, if dental treatment all over the world would be completely free for our patients, we could always offer the best possible treatment, which of course, regarding endodontically treated teeth like this, might be extraction of the tooth, bone augmentation, and insertion of implant. But if you weigh the costs of both treatment options, unfortunately, always the patient has to decide which the patient can afford. And our duty as dentists and periodontologists is, on one hand, from medical ethics, to do everything to preserve the natural resources of the patient, to preserve the patient's own dentition, on one hand, and on the other hand, to outweigh the risks. If a conservative treatment, that means preserving the patient's own teeth, is an option at all. What we can see here now is in the three-dimensional depiction, we see that the entire buccal alveolar crest compact bone 
is completely missing. The granuloma is going around the apex of the root and is going in the back of the root. So, a episectomy here in this case is definitely not an option. Now, maybe the patient will ask you, okay, I will lose the tooth. There is no way to preserve this tooth. There is no way to do a treatment with a good chance for longer persistence of this tooth. In the next step, the patient will ask you, yeah, but on Dr. Google, I read, you can extract the tooth and insert immediately an implant. But with a three-dimensional depiction, now you have the 100% proof that an immediate implant insertion is definitely not an option because the buccal bone plate of the alveolar crest is missing. No way to insert an implant simultaneously. So you will be able to explain to the patient and not only explain in the way that the patient has to trust you, you can show and demonstrate and prove the patient that there is no bone to receive an implant. That means that the patient will need bone augmentation surgery first and after some healing period, approximately six months, the patient can receive the implant only later on with an additional healing period of another three to four months. This gives you and the patient much more safety for a straightforward and almost fail-safe treatment. Because, of course, once again, there are different options. You can also do a bridge. When it also comes to the diagnosis, why in a certain case, maybe after some years of symptom-free endotontically treated teeth, you might suddenly see a granuloma in the third in, in two-dimensional x-rays and also then later on in the third dimension. Of course you want to know, but why did it happen? This tooth was asymptomatic for a very long period, in case the patient is in, in treatment in your office already since maybe 10, 12 years. You received the patient, you have seen, okay, this uh, tooth was endodontically treatment. Uh, in this case, as depicted here, not perfectly endodontically treatment, but it didn't show any symptoms and it didn't show any granuloma buildup around the apex. But now suddenly you see the granuloma. The reason is very simple, because endodontically treated teeth, they are brittle. And with the time, once you chew on them, especially when it comes to uh, molar teeth, they endure micro cracks in the longitudinal axis of the root. The cracks combine and finally the crack is going through from the crestal uh, section down to the apex. And this you will never ever be able to see in two-dimensional panoramic x-rays or intraoral x-rays. Why? Because the fracture site is radiologically blocked by the radiographic dense material of the root filling. Once you do a three-dimensional depiction, it's absolutely clear to you that the cause for the granuloma is a fracture in the longitudinal axis of the root. So, once again, if you just base your therapy options on two-dimensional radiographic imaging, you will never know until you are in the middle of your surgery that you are confronted with a root fracture. Because once you have a longitudinal root fracture, of course, Episectomy is not an option anymore because there is no way to seal up this fracture in the longitudinal axis of the root. It's not only for endodontics and periodontics, it's also for the periodontal diagnosis because we know that we have a lot of options in the periodontal treatment, but we need to know to which extent the periodontal disease already progressed. And for this, 
it's also better to know the three-dimensional constitution of the periodontal disease if the furcations are already um, affected by the periodontal disease, how the root configuration is, even if you just plan a conservative treatment, a periodontal hygienic treatment, instead of a surgical treatment of the periodontosis, then the periodontal hygienist, the periodontal hygienist assistant needs to know how is the configuration of the roots in the three dimensions so that is able to take the proper instrument for the proper cleaning in the periodontal therapy. Last but not least, we deal a lot of times with impacted teeth, with um, mesiodentists in young patients, and once they are very, very close, in case of the impacted third molars, once they are very, very close, already in the panoramic X-rays, close to the mandible nerve, of course we need to know exactly where the mandible nerve passes the impacted third molar. Sometimes it's on the buccal side, sometimes it's on the lingual side. Sometimes there is no bony material in between the impacted third molar and the mandible nerve anymore. So this gives you a very, very perfect chance to plan your surgery in a way that the patient at the end, especially when you remove teeth like this with piezotomes, that you avoid any harm to the mandible nerve so that the patient after the surgery even doesn't have a hyposensibility of the mandible nerve in the first the days or weeks after the surgery. And when it comes to young children in a two-dimensional panoramic x-ray, of course you will see the mesiodense, but you do not know if the mesiodense is on the palatal side or on the buccal side. And of course, especially with young children, with a growing skull, you are not supposed to open both on the buccal side and on the palate side. No, you need to know the exact, the precise position of the mesiodense in the third dimension so that you can choose the least invasive approach to remove this tooth without harming the secondary dentition. So I hope this gives you a very, very good insight why three-dimensional diagnosis nowadays is the gold standard in more and more cases replacing the two-dimensional imaging x-ray imaging for better diagnosis and for better therapy planning once again i want to show you a typical case <clears throat> if you do a panoramic x-ray you will see here there is a periodontal disease. Then we have some, um, in the clinical inspection, you will see there is a mobility of the bridge. But for you, just from the view of the panoramic x-ray, it's quite a clear case. Let's just extract, let's just cut off this uh, bridge. Let's extract the tooth. And then we can discuss about sinus lifting or bone augmentation of the alveolar crest to enable implant insertion later on. But what we do not see in these panoramic x-rays, because a lot of anatomical structures overlay each other, so they hide each other, is simply that, especially in this case, you can see not only we have a periodontal problem here with the second molar, but we also have a big cyst here in the first premolar region where we wanted to keep the tooth for the time being. And this you don't see if you just have a two-dimensional panoramic x-rays. What makes the situation even worse is simply the fact that we don't only have a periodontal disease here with a resorption of the subantral bone with an opening to the subantral floor. We also have a chronic sinusitis originating 
from the periodontal disease here. That means the periodontal disease started like any other periodontal disease. It engulfed the apices of the roots and then the, the, the inflammation started to resorb the bone of the sinus floor so that the effect was that the patient also has a chronic sinusitis caused by the periodontitis. And this, the cyst and the opening of the sinus floor, you will be able to see only before surgery when you do a three-dimensional depiction of the patient's anatomy because you might be in deep trouble once you extracted the tooth, you find out that there is a communication between the sinus and the alveolar crest and the oral cavity because the bone already was resorbed. Here you have inflamed tissue. So you have to completely plan a new strategy in the extraction procedure. When you know it before, you are prepared. If you just detect it during the surgery, then you might get in troubles because you don't have the proper planning. You have to do an in-time planning, an emergency planning in the situation, which is in most cases, especially in surgery, not the best way to deal with problems. And there is another issue that we can use with the most modern CBCT technology because most modern CBCT technology, we made a study for this and um, this study was published back in 2019, no, 2000, yeah, 2000 and, no, 2020, because we also investigated how reliable the pre-surgical determination of the bone quality is, because we know bone density determination in native bone is reliable. It corresponds with the primary stability of implants. When you do an Ostel test or if you do a ITV measurement, insertion torque value measurement, when you insert the implants. But as usual, we need to know this already before we start our surgery because once again, Dr. Google tells the patient, okay, you can insert implants and you can load them immediately. But immediate loading of implants is only possible if the bone quality, if the bone density, if the biomechanical stability of the bone is sufficient. And if you can find out only during surgery, which means you open the site, you drill, and during drilling you find more or less resistance in the drilling process, and finally, you insert the implant. Sometimes you can insert the implant, especially in the maxilla, simply with the hand because the bone is so soft or you need your ratchet because the bone quality is very high. So you need a lot of force to insert the implant. But only then you're able to choose, okay, now I can do an immediate loading or in a lot of cases, you cannot do it. The perfect solution is to know before. And we investigated this and these are the software tools that are given in your hand nowadays, especially with the XMind Trium CBCT, which is the most recent generation of modern CBCT technology. You can detect the bone, biomechanical bone quality, not only by values, but the software gives you very, very handy tools in your hands so that by a color scheming, you can see, okay, if it's green, the bone quality is very, very high. If it's more reddish, the bone quality is very low. In this case, you can see one of our patient cases in the course of our randomized clinical studies. You see here, the sinus lift was done with our intralift surgical method. And this is the remaining alveolar crest. And you can see here, the bone density in the native alveolar crest is very low, while the bone density after regenerating the, uh, the bone with the bone graft material is much, much higher. 
Of course, it's not high enough to do immediate loading, especially not in the molar region, but it gives you a better idea also about the healing times. If this would be all reddish, the healing time should be about five to six months. If this all is more greenish, that means the biomechanical stability of the bone is very, very good. Then you can choose to reduce the osseointegration time for the, uh, for the implant to approximately three to four months. The nice thing is, you know all this before you even start your surgery. You can show it to the patient. You can prove your predictions by simple depicting the real bone quality of your patient. And this is such a handy tool, not only for more safer and more predictable treatments, but also for long time success in implant surgery. But let's get back to piezotome surgical protocols in everyday clinical practice. I will guide you now through step by step one of the typical indications to use piezotomes nowadays. As I told you before in the presentation of the 3D um, issue regarding diagnosis on 2D um, radiologic Im uh, imaging or 3D radiological imaging, the patient, of course, wants to preserve his own teeth. Maybe he, the patient already invested in crowns, although the crowns are not that nice looking anymore. But anyway, we know episectomies have a very, very high success rates. So the patient, of course, might know this once again by Dr. Google. And we need to do the surgery in a way that we can already once again, preserve the anatomy 100%. So what are the difference to conventional episectomies with rotary instruments? This already starts with using piezotomes for raising the mucoperiosteal flap. So instead of taking a hand instrument, we use the PS4 tip for piezotome, which is used also for bone scraping. And you can see here, with hand instruments, it's almost impossible to prepare such a perfect mucoperiosteal flap. The periosteum, which is the carrier of the bone regeneration, the periosteum is the only tissue that delivers the pre-osteoblasts to the bone healing site. And this we have to preserve 100%. In the theory part, in the scientific part of this lecture, a little bit later on, I will prove you why there are so many differences between hand instruments and uh, piezotome instruments, starting with raising mucoperiosteal flaps. In the next step, we take a bone chisel, an ultrasonic bone chisel. It's the PS5 tip for piezotomes, because this is one of the tips beside this crest splitting tips that I will uh, present then at the end of the of the lecture in the breast split procedure. This tip is able to cut bone almost lossless. And instead of just taking a rotary instrument, a burr, and remove all the bone around the apex to access the apex and the granuloma, in this case we simply cut a window a bony window. It's the same procedure as we would do if we wish to transfer an autologous bone block to an augmentation site. We don't waste the patient's precious bone. We just cut a window. We remove the buccal bone plate, as you can see here, and we reveal the granuloma. We don't throw away this bone block because this is vital bone. Of course, we have to clean from granuloma tissue on the inside, but we keep it in saline solution. Now we proceed with the removal of the apex and of the granuloma. This is the so-called ninja tip. It's a very, very aggressive tip. And this tip is uh, 
not so safe on soft tissues, but it's fast and it's made for dentine, especially for episectomies and hemisections. And now the apex was removed and contrary to rotary instruments, once again, this utmost precision, this almost lossless cut with a smooth, perfect surface tells you in most cases why the granuloma developed. With rotary instruments, you will never able piece, uh, to see the microscopic structure of the apex of the root. That the filling is not, um, that, the, that the endodontic filling material was not condensed properly. And you can see the first hints of uh, small little fractures in the apex of the root. Now we get to the perfect removal of the granuloma. This we also do with the same tip with which we raised the mucoborostal flap. Now we use it in a scraping mode. And you have to experience this once. When you start to work with piezotomes and you do your first granuloma removal, just take your regular instrument and scratch off the granuloma. And then additionally take the piezotome tip and scrape again. And you will see how much of the granuloma tissue you always left in your whole career until now when you simply used only hand instruments to remove the granuloma. A lot of this granuloma tissue is left over, which now is perfectly cleaned with the piezotome surgical instruments. You see the procedure now, you raise the granuloma out of its socket and this is entirely removed. One positive side effect of piezotomes is also that the bleeding during the surgery is highly reduced because the cavitational effect of the piezotome is causing a temporary reduction of the blood flow in the surgical field. While after the surgery, after a few hours, the blood flow is increased. This is because the ultrasonic waves inserted into hard and soft tissues stimulate the regeneration much faster than when you work with rotary instruments. But this I will prove later on in the scientific part. Now it comes to the retrograde filling. This I will make a little bit shorter, but I want to show you also this picture to understand what the big difference between rotary instruments and piezotome surgical instruments is. Of course, when you wear a face shield and you work with rotary instruments, your face shield is always splashed with blood and with particles of the bone that you removed and with the saline solution you used. Contrary, ultrasonic cavitation effect and the ultrasonic oscillations of the tips cause the liquid, the cooling liquid, to stick to the instrument. This is why it's so much cleaner and so much more satisfactory to work with piezotome surgical instruments contrary to rotary instruments because you can work in a perfect clean environment. This was just only a side sentence. You only have to watch your assistant that the suction doesn't get too close to the surgical side because you want to avoid that the cooling solution is sucked away. Here again in a close-up, this is now the perfect preparation of the retrograde filling from a different angle. Now you do the retrograde filling of the apex of the root, you condense it, you wait until the material completely hardens. And finally, you remove the surplus of the cement with a diamonded tip that is originally meant to be used for sinus lifting, but since the sides are diamond coated, they are perfectly to smooth the surface and to rub away the surplus of the cement. Here you can see in a close-up, this is the movement and this is a perfectly sealed new apex of the root. And you can see it since the filling, the retrograde filling was perfectly condensed, you already see some slight longitudinal fissures in the dentin of the root.
And now comes the last step. Instead of just leaving this window open, and we perfectly know, especially when you take a look then some years later in a 3D depiction, but even in the clinical uh, impression, you can see that the bone here will never ever reconstitute in the original anatomy because the granuloma, it was already a little cyst, destroyed the bone here. So you will have a big uh, recession if you work with rotary instruments. Instead here, just like we do when we do autologous bone block transfers, we place the buccal bone plate back. So in case later on the tooth has to be extracted and then you want to insert an implant, you will have no bone here when you work with rotary instruments. That's for sure. Instead, when you reconstruct the anatomy already during the surgery, when you extracted the tooth, then the implant will have a firm seat also in the apical region. And this is now mandatory to look prospective because we know that also epistectomy doesn't guarantee a forever life of this treated tooth. Once it will have to be extracted. And then you can be 100% be sure that since you reconstructed the original anatomy, you extract the tooth with the piezotome surgical instruments, with the extraction toolkit, and you insert the implant immediately. This is how surgery should be performed nowadays. Then, of course, finally, you do the suture. Okay, you say, mm, very easy to do an upper second incisor. But now we take a little bit a more complicated case. It's the episectomy of a left lower first and second molar. Once again, we use the almost completely bone lossless free cutter, bone cutters for piezotomes. So you see here the first molar, the second molar is here in the back. And first we start to cut a bony window. And this we do with bone lossless cutters. Then instead of doing the episectomy immediately, we just remove the buccal bone plate. Now the buccal bone plate is prepared, but what it lacks is still the baseline osteotomy. And this buccal osteotomy, the vertical osteotomy, always is parallel to the root surface. To reach out to anatomical difficult regions, like in the mandibular angle on the left side, to do the baseline osteotomy, we have special tips that are angulated so that they are more easy to insert because there is no Ziploc on the cheek of the patient, so you need some angulation. So we use this one to very, very easily do the baseline osteotomy. You can see here the baseline osteotomy is marked. Then we complete the baseline osteotomy. And once the bone block is mobilized, you see by the perfection of the bone cut, by the lossless bone cut and the smooth osteotomy surfaces, you can remove the bone block and you already see here the alveola and you can see here the apices of the roots. The bone block is removed. This will be once again kept in saline solution. Of course, if you have the need of bone augmentation in the patient, you can use this bone block now for autologous bone block grafting. But in this case, there was no need to do this. So, of course, at the end of the surgery, we placed it back to reconstruct the patient's anatomy for a better healing. This later on has to be cleaned thoroughly from granulation tissue, but this is logical. And now we have a perfect view on the apices of the roots. We once again take the uh, dentin and bone saw and at a slight angulation, we just cut off the apices of the roots. And I remind you, we with piezotomes for a short time period, for about half an hour up to one hour, 
when we use the piezotomes in the bone, we can achieve a pretty good hemostasis. This is so important because when you remember when you do uh, procedures like this, especially in the molar region of the mandible, it's a lot of times it's pretty a bloody mess. You see here just a few bleeding, little bleeding, just enough to make sure this is vital bone, that the patient is still alive, but it doesn't obscure your view. You have a perfect view on the surgical side. You can do precise cuts, and this is done now with the uh, BS1 saw. Here you can see when the cut is finished. And finally, you can extract the apices of the roots. This is a case, it's already a little bit older, when 3D dimensional depiction of the patient's anatomy was not that easy and the resolution of the CT scans, of the CAT scans and the CBCT was not that good that it could be diagnosed. But this was, a, in this case, a surprise. We see a longitudinal fracture of the root. Of course, and this is the typical situation, if at that time when we did the documentation for the surgery, this was already back in 2007, because we had to um, start to collect educational material for our academy training programs for dentists, oral surgeons and maxillofacial surgeons for the surgical protocols with piezotomes. CBCT in such a perfect resolution as I have showed it before was not available. It's more than 15 years ago. So this was a surprise. Of course, during the surgery, it's very difficult to ask the patient, okay, um, let's say the prognosis for this tooth is not so good. Let's extract the tooth. No, because the patient only consented to do the episectomy. And once you try to get a consent in the intrasurgical uh, situation, in Austria at least, it's not possible because this consent is not valid because it was taken in an outstanding situation for the patient where he's not able to rationally judge which therapy option is the best. So, of course, in this case also we had to proceed with the episectomy. But, in fact, this tooth after 15 years is still in and this tooth after two years after the uh, episectomy we had to extract. So, these are now the apices of the first molar. Then we do the retrograde preparation, as I showed you before. It's the same procedure. Then we do the filling. And in this case, also, we tried to seal the fracture as good as possible. Here you see the filling, the retrograde filling after the polishing. Then you clean the side once again and you just place back the buccal bone plate. And it fits perfectly. You don't even need screws because the bone cut was almost lossless. And by the three-dimensional shape of this bone block, you just place it back. It's like a drawer in a, um, in a chest. And it cannot fall into the surgical side and it is safe to fall out from the surgical side by reverting the mucoperistal flap and the suturing. So, I hope this gave you a very, very good impression how modern surgical procedures with piezotomes can achieve a much higher precision and a much better surgical planning and surgical performance with the least trauma and the least uh, trauma to the anatomical um, to the anatomical structure of the patient. It is our duty to reconstruct, to do the right thing, but to keep the anatomical structure of the patients intact. Now, for the first time, we get to the basic science of bone healing, because we also have to understand how bone heals, so that we know why piezotomes in oral surgery are so superior to rotary instruments. My basic profession as oral maxillofacial surgeon is to reconstruct uh, smashed faces. You see here, 
this was a polytrauma. Every single bone of the facial skull was smashed and fractured. This is hours of reconstructing, putting together the puzzle and then inserting titanium plates and uh, titanium screws to stabilize the fractures, to give the patient his face back again. But actually, from the standpoint of the bone, there is no difference what we do as dentists, periodontologists and oral surgeons. We insert titanium screws, not to stabilize fractures, but to stabilize pr prosthetic treatment. And from the standpoint of the bone, the bone doesn't care if it was a fracture that is stabilized by titanium plane, plates and titanium screws, or if we insert titanium implants to stabilize prosthetic treatment. And this you always have to keep in mind. I mean, it looks so much different what I do here and what I do here, but from the standpoint of the bone, it's exactly the same. So how does bone heal? If the bone has a fracture, or if you simply drill a hole into the bone, or if you extract a tooth, the bone does not care. It's a lesion to the bone. That means, first, of course, you need to have a bleeding because the bleeding is the very base to attract the blood vessels to form connective tissue, which we call, in case of the bone, the callus. So, once the callus is formed, the connective tissue is formed, the blood vessels grow in and start to organize the collagenic basic fiber tissue of the bone. And only if the collagenic basic texture of the bone is reorganized and healed in the next step, and this is caused by the periosteum, because the periosteum sends the preosteoblasts to the traumatic site, we start to mineralize the collagenic fibers of the bone tissue. And once the fracture is healed, of course, when you load the bone, you have a constant reorganization and remodeling of the bone. It's a general medical knowledge, and of course, it's a general dental knowledge, that an injured bone cannot heal without immobilization. Just imagine you have a fracture and you don't get a cast, the bone won't heal. You need a fracture hematoma. Nowadays, the better fracture hematoma, of course, is PRF, platelet-rich fibrin, uh, Professor Shukrun, because this is necessary to attract the ingrowth of blood vessels. We all know this from the dry extraction socket syndrome. If there is no bleeding, the patient will come back some days later, you will see black bone and the black bone causes pain. You just scratch until you have a proper bleeding because you need the fracture hematoma for proper bone healing. This is for vascularization and then the peri periosteal induced bone formation. If we take a look at the histology of bone, the bone, every single trabecula, the compact bone, the small trabeculae in the sponges bone, every single bone plate is covered with periosteum from the inside and from the outside because periosteum is the only tissue that enables the mineralization of the bone. Then we have the osteoblast layers, which are the main part of the periosteum. You see here then the trabecular bone lamella and in case of the trabecular bone lamellas in the um, spongy bone, we don't speak about the periosteum, but the endosteum. But basically it's exactly the same. It's only much smaller, but it contains the same three osteoblasts that are delivered also from the periosteum. And this is so important why we have to preserve the periosteum I mean, for us, the raising a flap is just the, the beginning of a surgery. We don't lose too many thoughts about how we prepare the mucoperiosteal flap, but we have to prepare a perfect mucoperiosteal flap without destruction of the periosteum. Once again, as a take-home message, perfect is the enemy of the good. What we used until now 
for bone augmentation to mix the bone or the synthetic bone graft with autologous blood is now in a better version the IPRF because we concentrate all the proteins and the leukocytes that are necessary for the best possible and fastest bone healing. This is why instead of using a simple blood clot, we use IPRF nowadays. It's the same instead of using rotary instrument that just destroy bone, we use piezotomes. And now we get to the point. What is the scientific evidence for piezotome surgery? For this, I will give you chapter by chapter, step by step, the scientific evidence. We undertook a systematic review and meta-analysis. This I will do quite quickly. This is the Prisma flow diagram, how we chose the articles and how we evaluated the articles for the meta-analysis. What happens when we cut bone in the everyday routine with drills and burrs? The major drawbacks by scientific evidence are enormous procedural bone loss, unreliable osteotomy depth control, imprecision of bone cut by high tor torque moments, high risk of soft tissue injuries, just remember removing impacted third, third molars adjacent to the mandible nerve and deposition of metal shavings and bacterial contamination. Here you have the references. Contrary, when you use piezotomes, they completely differently act on bone. A piezotome, although the tips you use look somehow similar to jigsaws that we use on bone, to rotary instruments, diamond-coated rotary instruments, they were completely different because the piezotome handpiece delivers the ultrasonic impulses to the tip and they oscillate with 28 to 36,000 times per second at the range between 50 and 200 micrometers. And this ultrasonic oscillation in liquids causes the so-called cavitation effect. It's just micro explosion of micro gas bubbles rising from the acting part of the tip that just exert pressure to the surrounding tissues and this pressure separates the tissues at the weakest point. It's not smashing the bone like with rotary instruments. It's just separating the bone trabecular and the bone plates at their weakest point. To see this in a more comprehensible way, you see here high-speed video records from tips acting. Although you see the tip macroscopically is not moving at all, you can see here the generation of the cavitation effect in liquids. And of course, also bone contains liquid and the liquid is transported to the surgical site by the piezotone handpiece. This is the cavitation effect. You cannot see it when you work with the piezotomes, but I hope you can be now sure that the piezotome ultrasonic cavitational effect is there. To give another example, this is the resonance and the cavitation effect. I demonstrated this to you already before in the presentation of the episectomy. By the oscillation, the liquid is adhering to the tips and only the um, assistants should not suck it away. And here you see the cavitation effect at one of our tips we developed for the transcrestal sinus lift procedure. You see here at the end of the tip, the gas bubbles are emanating. They separate mechanically the tip from the surrounding bone and just by the micro explosion, the bone is detached and in case of a transcrestal approach, condensed. And this is the tip I've showed you before regarding the mucoperiostal flap elevation. And now you might understand why the flap elevation is not destroying the periosteum because the periosteum is separated by pressure waves of gas bubbles. Like you place in between a high pressure balloon and separate the tissue. There is no mechanical destruction of the periosteum.
Of course, there is also a possible drawback if you don't use piezotomes correctly. That means, especially when you don't use the proper saline solution flow. Then, of course, also piezotomes create heat. Cre heat creates bone necrosis. And if you are very close to sensible structures like the mandible nerve, you will boil the nerve. So you always have to stick and to follow precisely the surgical protocol advised not only by our academy also by the handling instructions when you receive your piezotome device if you use it correctly then you can do surgeries like this like mandibular nerve transposition with ease and with the least risk of permanent lesion of the mandible nerve let's start once again with the mucoperiosteal flap elevation as i told you before there is scientific proof. It was uh, done by a friend of mine, Professor Van See from Krems University in Austria. He compared what happens to the periosteal layer, to the, um, um, to the pre-osteoblast layer of the periosteum if you separate the periosteum from the bone with piezotomes and what happens if you separate it with hand instruments. The situation is quite clear almost complete destruction of the periosteum with hand instruments and clean separation of the pre-osteoblast layer of the osteoblast delivery tissue, the only tissue that can mineralize bone with piezotomes. We proved this also for our own developments like the intralift procedure and also the development of the tips for mucoperiosteal elevation with the piezotomes. If you, took, if you take a look at this microscopic shot of a mucoperiosteal tunnel technique, it's one of the techniques that are enabled with the piezotome in a much better way than until now, you see the only trauma was made to the connecting blood vessels between the periosteum and the bone there is not the slightest remnant of periosteum, of, pre of dead pre-osteoblasts on the bone. Next, soft tissue preservation and molecular biological healing induction. Once again, I want to demonstrate you in high-speed video clips what are the properties of these piezotome surgical devices when you raise mucoperiosteal flaps. You see here, at 1000 frames per second that the tip is standing still but all these micro bubbles these micro bubble explosions are emanating from both the back side and the front side of the tip this is now a shot with 4000 frames per second and this is what separates the periosteum from the bone and not the simple scraping act as we do with uh, periosteal elevators and this is now with 60 frames per second so this is now a little bit more close to reality so you don't have to worry it goes pretty fast and much cleaner and much easier than ever before with mucoperiosteal elevators but this is unfortunately something you can see only in special videographs taken with high-speed cameras and which you can only experience by the ease of preparation when you use piezotomes in your daily routine. Let's speak about procedural bone loss. I told you before, and this I can make very quick because this is obvious. If you prepare an autologous bone block, either for opening a site to do an episectomy or for autologous bone block transfer, uh, for, for these cases it's even more critical, then of course simply by using burrs, simply because burrs smash bone and crush bone and they have a certain diameter and they remove bone, which you cannot recollect anymore, you see there is a big difference of the outcome of the autologous bone block harvesting. With rotary instruments, you lose sometimes more than 50% of the available bone, which you urgently need for the augmentation procedure. Instead, with piezotome surgical instruments, you lose, in case of using the saw, which is the most fastest way to cut bone with piezotomes, almost no bone. 
And with certain tips, some of the tips uh, which were developed by my research group, they 100% cut bone, bone lossless. You lose no bone for the later on augmentation procedure. And since we did also a comparison with lasers, unfortunately also with lasers, you lose a lot of bone beside the bone necrosis caused by the heat uh, created by the lasers on the bone. Maximum soft tissue pro uh, protection cutting selectivity. For this, I simply show you a clinical example. With the same adjustment of the piezotone, I touch the cornea of the eye bulb of the sheep. And you see not the slightest disruption of the cornea. No lesion to the eye of the unfortunately dead sheep. And with the same adjustment, you see the, the action of the piezotone was not interrupted. I can cut bone. This is the so-called cutting selectivity of piezotomes. It has something to do with the oscillation range, the 26,000 to 36,000 oscillations per second, which makes it almost impossible to put lesion to soft tissues. Let's speak about the quality and speed of bone healing, which I stated before in my opening showing the clinical cases. This is also nothing like wishful thinking. This was proven by, for instance, Professor Salvador Nares, a very good friend of mine, professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, one of the most renowned research institutions for maxillofacial surgery, he undertook an experiment. He simply took in an animal experiment rotary instruments and piezotomes, and he just made cuts into the bone. And then he investigated which type of treatment of osteotomy device gives the best possible and the most speediest healing. And he found out that using piezotomes increases the speed of bone healing histologically, significantly, compared to rotary instruments. Okay, this is a experimental setup where the bone healing speed was investigated histologically. But of course, we want to even go one step further and understand why it is like this. And there is a second investigation, which was performed by Professor Preti already back in 2017. He presented the histological results regarding the osteoblast activity. So, what did he investigate? He cut bone with rotary instruments and he cut bone with piezotomes. And then he was investigating both the number of the osteoblasts and the activity of the osteoblast. And as you can see here, after seven days, the osteoblast activity at sites cut with the piezotomes was more than double time higher than with rotary instruments. After two weeks, the osteoblast activity and osteoblast number was almost four times higher than with rotary instruments and already 56 days after, still the osteoblast activity was significantly higher than with rotary instruments. So this is now why you know that bone healing speed, once you cut bone with piezotomes, is significantly higher. Not because of some magical effect. No, it's because ultrasonic waves stimulate bone tissue growth and bone tissue re regeneration and also soft tissue regeneration. This is used in orthopedic surgery for a very, very long time. If you have a complicated bone fracture, then we know simply by using ultrasonic waves transduced at the safe wavelengths of the piezotomes into soft tissues and bone, speed up the healing and sometimes it's the only way to make complicated fractures heals that without ultrasonic stimulation wouldn't heal at all. 
Last but not least, we also have to speak about post-surgical patient morbidity. When we change completely from rotary instruments to piezotome surgical instruments back in 2005, 2006, suddenly we observed that when patient came back from impact to third molar surgery or some other surgery, they reported less pain and less swelling. Of course, this was just the clinical impression. So we based this on a randomized clinical study, which was published back in 2011. Um, we made a split mouse study on, uh, with comparable impacted, hor horizontally impacted third molars uh, in our patients. One side, we uh, did the surgery conventional with rotary instruments. On the other side, with only piezotone surgical instrumentation. And we evaluated the results when we take the pain and swelling for rotary instruments as the gold standard at the, that time, back in 2005-2006, as 100% and compare it with the results of using only piezotome surgical instruments, we found a 50%, more than 50% reduction of pain and swelling in our patients. Uh, when we published this study, it was very, very controversially discussed because it was one of the first studies presented. But meanwhile, this study was repeated not only for impacted third molars, also for episectomies, for orthognatic surgery. In virtually every field of oral and cranio maxillofacial surgery, it is proven that when you're using piezotome surgical instruments, you significantly decrease, sometimes more than 50% decrease, patient morbidity after the surgery. Here are some more references regarding superior bone healing, just to give you a, a, an idea that all I told you is just the concentration of contemporary knowledge why piezotome surgical instrumentation is superior to rotary instruments. And of course, since we publish mostly in free access journals, the uh, systematic review was published in the International Journal of Cranio, Cranio and Maxillofacial Science. You are free to download the entire paper. It's very long, but in every detail, you can read the scientific proof, the scientific evidence why piezotones are superior to rotary instruments. Here are some other references, but I will make this short because this you can look up by yourself if you want to. So, to make a summary, what is the issue today? Once again, the better or the perfect is the enemy of the good. At his time, this BMW was the perfect car. Nowadays, it's this car. Everything develops. Pantare, as the old Greece said, everything flows. And we, our te technological achievements should be used for the good of our patients, not only on the ethical basis. Let's make a short summary. What are the advantages of piezotome use in our patients compared to rotary instruments? We have a minimized thermal bone necrosis. Of course, with piezotomes, you can cause a thermal bone necrosis if you don't use the piezotomes properly. This I have to state clearly. You have to have enough saline flow, enough irrigation to create the cavitation effect instead of creating simple heat. We have a smooth osteotomy service. This is self-explaining. Bacterial contamination prevention because we use uh, ultrasonic waves also to make the cavitation effect to make the bacteria that are in the periodontal pockets explode. And this is how we uh, decontaminize the surgical area. We have an improved bone healing. I demonstrated this before. High precision of bone cut design. Try to cut an S or a V shape or any kind of shape you can imagine with rotary instruments. With the piezotome, you can do this. Almost lossless bone cut. This, I hope, I proved by clinical pictures, precise depth control, partly possible with rotary instruments, at the highest precision possible with piezotomes, prevention of soft tissue injuries, 
remember the sheep head and the sheep eye bulb and significant reduction of post-surgical patient morbidity. So this is why I clearly have to state, and I stated this already some 10 years ago, but piezodome surgery, piezodome surgical instruments are superior to rotary instruments. And as the time flows, we have to adapt to this new evidence, clinical evidence for the benefit of our patients. As a take home message, at the current state of scientific knowledge, not hope, not expectancies, but scientific knowledge and evidence, piezotome surgery outclasses traditional rotary instruments and lasers on molecular biological micro and macroscopic level significantly by improved bone healing and provides the least post surgical morbidity and intra and post surgical complication rates because we also preserve the soft tissues. That means Pizzotone surgery is the new gold standard. Now let's speak about the indications. Let's get back again from the dry scientific evidence to the everyday clinical routine you're interested in. So, as a repetition, as we use CBCT for the enhancement of daily routine diagnostics for granuloma cyst, endodontic, periodontal state, impacted teeth, and mesodense detection, we use piezotomes in the daily routine surgery for episectomy cysts. I demonstrated this already. Then, of course, for extraction, there are special tip sets for every type of surgery. For periodontal surgery, which is also much cleaner and much more predictable when we do it instead with the old fox curettes, when we do it with ultrasonic surgical devices. I mean, you have to experience this once. You have to do it once by yourself. You do a periodontal pocket cur curette with the hand curettes, and then you do it with pe uh, piezotome periodontal surgery toolkits. This is, this is not comparable anymore the cleanness and the preciseness of piezotome surgical instrumentation is unprecedented. And of course, use for impacted teeth. And here we already get to this one of the most important issues in the everyday daily office, impacted third molars. This is a classical situation. Here you can see an impacted third molar with a corona cyst. You have to remove it. And of course, this tooth is vital. So it's very, very difficult to keep this tooth vital when you work with rotary instruments. And as you can see here, this is what sometimes is left when you do it with rotary instruments. Bone necrosis, a dehiscency, etc., etc. If we take a comparable case and we want to restore the full anatomy of our patients, we do it that way. And for this, I will show you now the surgical video. When we remove an impacted horizontal tooth, it's the case I showed you before in the slide. You see here the panoramic x-ray. It's also a video from a time where CBCT was not commonly available. And in my dental clinic, I didn't have one. So I will make this a little bit louder so you can hear my comments. At mode D2. And as you have seen before in the uh, cutting procedure, for the episectomy, we do exactly the same. Instead of milling away the bone all around uh, the impact the third molar and um, the, the second molar here, we just do a vertical cut to remove the bone plate. So, when we do the soft tissue closure, we are not in the critical area where the dehiscencies can occur. The baseline osteotomy, we use the DS2 saw. Once again, remember the episectomy of the left side, first and second molar. I demonstrated. Here is the baseline osteotomy. When we take the spatula, 
and we need the bomb block here. And you can see here now the system. And you can see here the adhering parts of the coroner cyst, which we will have to remove now the entire osteotomy and the cyst. This we use the non-sharp tip from the sinus lift set and not the sharp set from the bone grafting set, bone surgery. 80 milliliters. Because without any force, we catch the seat. So instead of using the scraping um, with the sharp edge we use from the sinus lift tip set because I know, I, I did know from my experience that there was no chance that the mandible nerve was not inside the cyst cavity. And here you can already see the crown of the impacted cell molar. I knew I had to, to take the uh, non sharp tissue. From the extraction tip. set at mode 2, fine tuning 1, 80 milliliters per minute. So this is for tooth extraction the ligament cutter. You have seen it at the beginning of the lecture how we use it. It's just cutting the periodontal ligament, separating by the cavitation effect the surface of the root from the adjacent surface of the bone. Without any anesthesia, with adrenaline. So you can see the crown. And now the tooth is born without any force. And here it comes. Not the working time until now was nine minutes fifty seconds. Okay. Here is the tooth. Okay, the SL4, I think. So now we detach the cyst from the surrounding bone and we perfectly know, also in this case from experience, not from 3D depiction, that the mandible nerve was exposed to the cyst. So this is why in this case I used the blunt tip and not the sharp tip which I use for mucoperiosal elevation because when we get close to the nerve and I press with the sharp edge on the nerve of course then the edge can cut. So I always stay on the maximum shape size. And the, the completely unharmed. And here you can see the nerve. Here is the nerve. The only bleeding comes from a Falkman vessel up here. Yeah, you see? The nerve was completely exposed to the cyst cavity, but it is not harmed. And this you cannot achieve with rotary instruments. Then we do and some proper clean cleaning. The attached cyst tissue. For this we use the sharp edged mucoperiosal elevator or bone scraper. We now take a collagenous sponge and place it right on top of the nerve without any pressure. And since this is a critical size defect, such a like big defect cannot be... We just drop it in, no pressure. The bone does not heal, it cannot fill such a big cavity. So we have to um, give an adjuvant motivation to the bone with uh, bone graft material. Just to fill the scaffold, okay. then you have the blood vessel ingrowth like any other bone augmentation procedure. So now we placed it and now we put it back in the anatomical correct position. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. Okay. And what you can see here now is the osteotomy is so precise that you don't need to fix it with any screws. You can press it. You can see what I do here. You can see I press it and it doesn't move. So no need for screws or for any other type of attachment. You see, I press inside, I press inside. No way that it moves, okay? Absolutely precise. Then we put back the flap, do our switches, and we are done. And netto working time was now 45 minutes. Okay, I hope this was impressive enough to show you. Of course, this is not something you do every day because the cases like this are quite rare. But with this video, I want to demonstrate how safe it is to do surgeries like this where the surgeon always fears mm, the chances are quite high that they ruin the nerve. Yeah, it's so how easy cheesy. This is another case example, uh, preparing an impacted canine on the palatal side. So the surgical procedure is that you just reveal the crown of the tooth. Then you do some splitting of the tooth because normally with rotary instruments, you will have to remove half the palate to get access to this tooth. And once again, you can see here the so-called ninja tip. It's a quite aggressive tip, which shouldn't be used adjacent to soft tissues, nerves, etc. because this um, has a 50% mechanical. It's not only the cavitation effect, because if you cut animal and dentin, you need a much higher power and you need mechanical force to separate this. So this is only for uh, working on tissues that have to be removed. So the coronal part of the impacted tooth is removed and the rest is then loosened with the periodontal ligament cutters. You see there is also a little hook here and is completely removed. Now the milk tooth is removed and since you didn't destroy the bone at all you just removed you have a hollow space of the removal of the impacted canine that's the only hollow space you have in the bone all the rest of the bone was kept as it is it was not destroyed it was kept as it is keeping the perfect anatomical structures of course you can achieve primary stability for the implant you can insert the implant simultaneously the trauma for the patient is less. You don't need to have a second surgery for augmentation and maybe a third surgery for insertion of the implant. So this reduces the overall treatment time for this patient from up to one year down to three to four months. Another example of piezotome ridge preservation, tooth removal and implant insertion of a left upper second premolar and this case was especially delicate because this second premolar, this ankylized second premolar, which gave the patient some pain and was already at the end of his life, was in between two adjacent implants. Because sometimes it's very difficult to convince the patient that once you place an implant in the first molar and in, in, in the first premolar side, um, leaving a ankylosed natural tooth inside is a little bit critical, but if the patient doesn't allow to extract this tooth, we have to extract it once it is time. So as you can see, we just loosen the tooth between the two adjacent implants. You will see a uh, intraoral x-ray right afterwards very very carefully you keep the tip of the uh, tip on the surface of the root because you glide in between 
the periodontal between the surface of the root and the adjacent bone, just by the cavitation effect cutting the periodontal ligament. So with two fingers you can then extract the tooth and in the most recent version of implant insertion in the maxilla and also in the mandible, my research group developed a tip set to do the pilot drilling and the final drilling for the implant to be inserted. This was designed especially for tooth extraction and Im immediate implant insertion. Why? Because once again, with the piezotome tips, with the implant tips, we don't remove bone. We condense the bone. We make the more weak than the mandible sponges bone of the maxilla better by bone condensing. I mean, these are all traditional methods where until now you had to use special instrumentation. Nowadays, you don't need this special instrumentation anymore because you have the piezotomes that work far, mo far more superior than the traditional instruments. So with ascending diameter, we prepare into the depth and condense the bone. And then finally, of course, once the preparation is finished, we can insert the implant. And always keep in mind, remember the slide I showed you regarding the osteoblast activity. By simply applying the ultrasonic waves to the bone, we increase the transgradients of the pre-osteoblasts into the side. So, of course, you will have a more far faster osteointegration. And you see, um, implantologists know what it means when you see that the implant has to be inserted by a ratchet. This is perfect primary stability. Not enough for immediate loading, but perfect primary stability. Occlusion control, if the angulation of the implant is in the correct way. It's also very, very easy to do with piezotomes, much more easy than with rotary instruments with burrs because in the socket the burr wants to glide away. We do the intraoral scan and this is the new implant and with the two adjacent implants. Perfect solution. And surgeries like this, of course, in lectures I always have to show the extreme cases. But always keep in mind, once you start with piezotome surgical instrumentation, you get used to it. Then for you cases like this where you have not so funny feelings before you start the surgery because a lot of things can go wrong. Once you have a three-dimensional planning and you have piezotome surgical instrumentation, you know it's going as most easy as possible. Of course, we also use uh, piezotomes in orthodontic and orthognatic surgery. With a piezocision tip set for this, I give you a short video because this is I don't know if it's a topic in Bulgaria, but um, to enhance orthodontic tooth movement, especially in the United States, is very, very popular. But would you ever do a surgery like this to cut the bone in between adjacent roots to speed up orthodontic treatment? Personally, I have to tell you, I refuse to do it. I never did it like this. But with the development of the piezocision tips by Professor Dibar from France, a very famous orthodontist. In cooperation with periodontologists, he developed this tip set. You just make slight incisions. And if you have a very crowded orthodontic situation, of course, also this you can do planning in a 3D, um, in a 3D depiction of the patient's anatomy. You can also then produce a surgical guide for the piezotone tip and then you just do the monocortical osteotomy, the weakening of the bone by simple slits of the mucoperiosteum. You don't raise a mucoperiosteal flap, you just slit it and then you do the uh, monocortical osteotomy. And since it's so minimal invasive, you don't detach periosteum from the bone, you just weaken the bone. The nutrition of the bone is kept intact. And this is why with this method, the 
speeding up of orthodontic treatments, the enhancement of orthodontic treatments, especially of very complicated tooth movements like rotation of canines, etc., is predictable to do with piezotomes. Guided bone regeneration. Let's do this fast. You can use uh, piezotomes in every case of guided bone regeneration, vertical alveolar crest splitting, intralift, sinus lift, subperiosteal tunnel technique, mandibular nerve transposition, distraction, sandwich osteotomy. I never ever use in oral surgery and maxillofacial surgery rotary instruments anymore. Let's take a look at the surgical protocol for a flapless crest split and widening technique. It's a typical situation. You see a very narrow alveolar crest, but of course you want to insert implants. You depict in the third dimension the mandibular nerve, which is here signed in red, and you already plan the proper position of the implants. But you see the space, let's say the alveolar crest, is too narrow. So what comes next is, until now, you did you did autologous bone block transfer. That means you had the first surgery, you took out the bone blocks from the ramus mandibulae on the left, on the contralateral side, because this is on the right side, so you had to take it from the left side, you screwed it on top of the alveolar crest, and then you had to wait for six months until you can insert the implants. Now with piezotome surgery, we are able to split bone which is on top of the crest as narrow as one millimeter because these are the tips that were developed by my research group they cut bone oh, oh they cut bone definitely bone lossless so what we do is we do a mesiodistal incision we just flap open the side the mucoperiosteum to identify precisely the top of the alveolar crest then we do a mesiodistal vertical osteotomy with the CS1 tip. Then we do buccal relief osteotomies. You just have to imagine it works like uh, creating a door blade. And contrary to the crest splitting techniques published in the current literature, and published also in surgical videos on YouTube. We don't raise a mucoperiosteal flap. We don't want to distract, we don't want to disrupt the entity of the periosteum to the bone. Because once you raise a mucoperiosteal flap, you interrupt the nutrition of the bone. And this is an absolute no-go. Whenever possible, always try to work flapless. Because interrupting the nutrition of the bone, the separation of the periosteum from the bone leads to procedural resorption of the bone, procedural atrophy of the bone, which counteracts our target to preserve the bone. And this is why we develop this type, because bone is elastic. Don't ever think bone is something mineralized and stiff. No, stiff bone um, it's called the glass bone sickness. This is a sickness if bone is only mineralized but doesn't contain collagenous fibers. The basic fabric of bone is collagenous fibers, as I presented to you before in the uh, scientific session. Now, once the bone was distracted, you see it can be easily distracted with our tips, we then use the implant drills counterclockwise because we don't want to scrape off bone. At this surgery we didn't have our uh, implant drills, piezotome drills at this time, so we had to use the drills. But once again you can see from the, from the use of the ratchet, this is highest possible primary stability. And this is the secret of long-term implant success. The higher the primary stability, the insertion torque value is, the better the prognosis for the implants. <laughs> so the implants are inserted, they are primary stable. The gaps in between the implants are filled with synthetic bone graft. We mostly use self-hardening bone graft material. Of course, we have to place the cover screws though. And you see, 
just a mesiodistal mucoperiosteal incision, a minimal invasive booklet flap just to reveal the surgical site. This is the self-hardening bone graft material. And this is the least possible trauma for the patient. It's not only the effect of the ultrasonic waves that leads to more than 50% less pain and swelling. It's simply the fact that you don't reach big mucoperiosteal flaps. And when you ask yourself, but how can be a sealed suture, a, a full wound closure can be achieved? This is by the anatomy of the, of the sloppy crest, the soft tissue anatomy of the sloppy crest, so that in almost all cases you will be able, even if you work flapless, to close the uh, wound site primarily sealed. And we don't use single sutures, but we, don't, uh, we, we use running sutures. And this is now the final result. You see, <coughs> we achieved a widening of more than four millimeters. Down here, you can see this, the distracted bone plate, the implant in between the lingual and the buccal bone plate. And this is thick. This is the minimum of two millimeters. This is the situation one week after at uh, suture removal. perfectly healed. And this is then the prosthetic treatment after four months. The impression posts and the final prosthetic treatment with ceramic rounds. And you can also see the nice outline, the natural outline and the perfect emergence profile for the prosthetic treatment. This is how surgery should be performed. We made also a clinical study, a randomized clinical study comparing piezotome crest split versus buccal autologous only grafts because we know that during in the course of healing using only grafts we lose a lot of bone width and our hypothesis was that with uh, alveolar crest split we can achieve at least the same or better results. So we treated 533 patients with the flapless piezotome crest split, the, piezo uh, the control group comprised of 531 patients. This is once again the surgical protocol, but you have seen it in a live surgery. Here, another case in the upper jaw, minimal invasive incision, minimal invasive booklet flap distraction, placing the, uh, the self-hardening bone graft. In this case, for the study, we didn't insert implants simultaneously, logically, because with only grafts with autologous bone blocks, this almost never is possible. Here you see the original situation, 1.2 millimeter, distraction to 6.7 millimeter, and after six months of healing, the final result of alveolar crest width was 5.7 millimeters. And the results over surgery time comparison. I mean, it's no wonder that when we use a minimal invasive approach with piezotomes, the surg overall surgery time for the surgeon and the patient is significantly lower with less than 40 minutes, while uh, autologous bone block transfer takes, about, takes more than 90 minutes. The alveolar rich width pre, post and six months post-surgery was better than with the autologous bone block. But honestly, I have to tell you, the difference between the final outcome was not significantly. That means we have a known non-significant difference between autologous bone block and piezotome flapless crest split. What was highly significant was once again, 50% less pain and swelling in the first 14 days after the surgery when we use the flapless piezotone crest split. What are the clinical implications from this randomized clinical study? Flapless piezotone crest split is a significant less traumatic alternative to buccal only grafting with autologous bone blocks. Flapless piezotone crest split achieves better results regarding final horizontal alveolar crest width, but not significantly. And Flapless piezotone crest split provides significant less surgery time consumption and post-surgical morbidity. For the closure of this lecture, because now it's already almost two hours and I hope 
you are still in front of your screens watching and didn't just switch off. I just want to give you a typical case, which also should be a case you should do once you start. We have a uh, alveolar crest height above the mandible nerve of about 12 millimeters. This is then the situation after the surgery. This is the situation when we did the prosthetic treatment 3.5 months after. This is the surgical procedure, once again in photo shots. Mesiodistal incision, vertical osteotomy with CS1 tip. Here you see the splitting, the bone lossless splitting. Buccal relief osteotomies, they are mandatory. This you are not supposed to leave out because otherwise you have aerogenic artificial fracture somewhere in between the distractal bone plate, especially when it's such a narrow alveolar crest of only one millimeter on top of the crest. The distraction with the tips, then the insertion of the implants, placing of the bone graft material. And once again, you don't have to worry. In most cases, you will be able to have a tight wound closure without any additional procedures. In case this is not possible due to uh, the patient anatomy, of course, you can place PRF membranes or um, collagenous membranes. And this is the final outcome, very similar to the video I showed you before. This is then the final uh, prosthetic treatment. In the radiographic follow-up, you can see the situation after one year unchanged, after five years unchanged, and after 10 years unchanged, which is mostly not the case when you use autologous bone block grafting. This is a case in the upper jaw. You've seen it already in the clinical study. Also 1.2 millimeter alveolar crest width. This is immediately after the widening, just to show you, once we had the CBCT scans for the clinical studies, we also did the CBCT scan during the surgery because we wanted to see if we were precisely on the spot where we planned everything in the virtual 3D CBCT planning. And this is then the final outcome, the clinical situation. And once again, the implants perfectly placed right in the middle, thick buccal bone plate protection against later bone resorption and the minimum of two millimeter buccal bone width for implants in the upper and in the lower jaw. So finally, I come to an end. I thank you very, very cordially for your attention. It was a very, very long lecture, but unfortunately, it was necessary to do such a long lecture because I wanted to give you the safety that all the presentations you might see also in future on other congresses regarding the use of piezotome surgical instruments they are not based on commercial uh, wishful thinking of some companies that want to sell you something. No, it is based on pure scientific evidence. And this is why we founded our academy, the International Academy of Ultrasonic Surgery and Implantology back in 2007, because we understood at that time without scientific evidence that the future will be ultrasonic surgery by simple clinical experience because we used it every day and we saw the everyday better results than with rotary instruments. And then we started to think, but how can we revive or how can we develop new surgical techniques with less invasive procedures and more predictable results? And this was the aim why we founded our academy. And of course, unfortunately, nowadays, it's not possible to uh, develop new technologies without cooperation of the industry. And this is some kind of uh, disclosure of some um, um, presentation of my conflict of interests. Of course, all participants, the executive board and all researchers in our academy have to cooperate with companies. Some cooperate um, most cooperate with the Actium company because together with Actium we found a partner to uh, develop even better piezotome surgical devices but some of our members also cooperate with other companies like Mectron etc etc so unfortunately 
a development is not possible without the aid of the industry anymore because the s resources of our universities decrease and they have not the technological knowledge, for instance, to develop new tips, to manufacture new tips. So you are kindly invited to visit our academy's webpage. We have a video learning channel where you find old videos regarding teaching how you perform certain types of surgeries with piezotomes and all lectures and all the scientific backgrounds, all our publications and publications published regarding comparison between rotary instruments and piezotomes. This is free access. You don't have to pay. You don't have to register. You don't have to log in. You just go to our webpage and whatever you're interested in, starting with tooth extraction with piezotomes versus rotary instruments, up to uh, bilateral sagittal split osteotomy in orthodontic surgery, you will find all educational material, not only in videos, but also the scientific background and all the reference lists that you might need to, sel uh, to self-reassure you that you are on the right track. I thank you for your attention and now I'm open to ask, uh, now I'm open to answer your questions. Thank you very much.